um, then I will speak second. And then we will have Prime Minister of Moldova of, in 2015, Kirill Gaborici, and who was also Minister of Economy and Infrastructure in 2018 and 19 of Moldova. And if Roshan, it's okay, then I will give the floor now to um, Mrs. Tsipilivni for her yes, remarks. Please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see you. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello to, to, to see you too. Hello to the uh, colleagues of uh, uh, the organization. Uh, uh, to the leaders, and uh, uh, today we are going to speak uh, about the sea and the challenges for uh, democracy, global democracy. And I think that times uh, when we speak about um, democracy, we feel that these things are the obvious, but we need to take in consideration the changes in the international uh, community. And let's start by speaking about alliance that was created after the Second World War, when uh, the idea was to have transatlantic um, uh, connection alliance uh, that was not only based on the need to meet or uh, to act against new threats, but also it was based on uh, same values and understanding that also these values, the democratic values, liberal values, sometimes need to be defended, not only from external uh, enemies, but uh, sometimes also from the inside. And what is happening now is that uh, these values and this understanding are, are being eroded. And... Um, what was the institutions that were built after the Second World War, like the United Nations and the World Bank and the IMF, uh, those that uh, basically represented the same uh, to these values and to help also within the international community, those countries uh, behind this uh, understanding is being eroded. And what happened during all these years is that while technological uh, advancement and globalization have brought progress and prosperity to different parts of the world, and uh, this is something that, of course, um, uh, created a huge change and something that I believe that opened uh, different countries to advancement and the technology, but happened as well is that uh, inequality within different countries and also between countries was uh, extended and too many uh, people have been left behind with the feeling that the world is changing, that uh, they are not, that there is a huge uncertainty that their children uh, have uncertainty about their life, about their jobs, uh, about the ability to live uh, in, in, in a good conditions, professions that were quite distinguished and uh, professions in the past now are becoming part of maybe something that is disappearing. Uh, and on top of this, um, immigration to all the of, of job seekers. And this kind of uncertainty was translated into frustration and fear. And this led to oil to Not, but what is more uh, problematic is that uh, they crossed also the line between um, patriotism, which is loyalty and devotion to one's country, and nationalism that is not only about believing and loving your own country, but also it's uh, exalting one nation above the other. And now the world, the international community is facing two uh, new threats or challenges. One is, of course, COVID, the pandemic. Hopefully, we'll uh, um, pass this period in time with 
some, I don't know, vaccination remedy that will turn it into something that is less threatening the international community. But global warming is, is here and now, and altogether we are facing these threats, while simultaneously we are having more and more uh, populistic leaders and more and more uh, fear and frustration that is turned into hatred. Hatred against minorities in the society, hatred against other nations. In an era that uh, social networks are, are giving a space and a place to disinformation, misinformation, and hate speeches. Now, the whole idea of social networks, networks of course, was to, to connect people around the world, which is a very good, uh, a very good uh, message and uh, technology that can serve this interest, but it is being exploited by those that are spreading hatred. Um, and uh, this also is, is changing the nature of democracy and its values that in the base of, of the democratic values is respecting the other, is accepting the different ways of, of people to express their own faith, religion, uh, or, or anything that makes you different, but yet respected by the others, instead being subject to hatred and sometimes also, unfortunately, uh, violence. Now, there's a need uh, in order to face this challenge, there's a need uh, for cooperation between uh, different countries and leaders, but not only, because uh, um, leaders cannot do it by themselves. And this is the role of, of young generation, of spreading this message that the democratic values are not weakness, it's not part of the past, but it is part of our identity. That being a, 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 a democrat, believing that we are also citizens of the world, we are all patriotic to our own countries and states, means that we have the same uh, set of values. Another uh, challenge that uh, it is now uh, happening, and we saw it uh, when the United States decided to leave Afghanistan. In, and, and, and this is a huge challenge of the free world asking, is there a role for the free world? And what is the role of the United States in the free world in a situation like uh, there was a terrorist, designated terrorist organization like Taliban? Uh, that is not only a terrorist organization against others, but also do not accept rights of women within uh, the Afghani uh, society. Uh, is there something, or is there a role or responsibility of, of, of the free world to do something about it? Uh, would the world recognize, um, and it's a huge question now, um, would recognize and legitimize uh, an administration, a government that basically represents something which is completely the opposite. And this is something that basically we are facing in the Middle East, in different parts of the Middle East, and, and in other places and uh, in the world. So uh, no one can meet this challenge alone. And therefore, it is so important that we are having this discussion that uh, we are thinking about what is the best way to cooperate. Cooperation between countries, between leaders, between, uh, between peoples, in society. The question is uh, how to spread this, uh, this message. Uh, and especially how to share this old vision as a new vision a new idea, identity, something that can be a trend to young generation that feel that they are anti-establishment, that the establishments in their own countries are, you know, the old guys, 
they don't feel connected to, uh, they feel sometimes that, and, and sometimes also uh, rightly so, that uh, uh, the politicians are not, do not represent them as society, as human beings. And uh, uh, this, is, this is a huge challenge altogether to, to global democracy. And uh, therefore, what, what are we doing uh, today, and uh, not only today, is to try and find the common denominator, uh, regaining our democratic values, in an understanding that there's, you, sh you don't need to choose uh, between being a patriot or, or, or representing the interest of your country and state and taking care of human rights that are being violated, whether it is within your own country or in other parts uh, of the world. And I hope that we will all uh, succeed in um, um, in, in relating to this, in uh, describing this, and basically in, in spreading this uh, message uh, all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And I think that there are many issues there we'll, that we will discuss during our question and answer period. And if, if um, you don't mind, I'll take the floor now and give a little talk as well. I've also so been asked- I need to leave now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to leave. Maybe there, then if you could take yeah. two, two or three questions then. I can take it now, but I cannot win. I can okay. take it. Of course, are there any questions? Does anybody raise their hand to the prime minister? I think everyone was preparing their questions for the end and so are not quite ready. So um, uh, um, if you allow, we can collect the questions and then we will uh, send it to Mr. Pilivni. And then definitely I'm sure that Mr. Pilivni, whenever she will have time to respond and we'll share okay. with everyone. No, I, I said it in advance. Yes, definitely. You say you from. Well, thank you very much for your very insightful remarks. And we will continue the discussion on human rights now. And if there are questions, we will forward them to you. Thank you. All right. Now, this for me is an extremely important issue. And it's one that has been a passion of mine for more than 40 years. And since our goal in our forum is to share experiences I wanted to talk to you about my view of human rights and my own experience with human rights over four decades. Um, I am someone who spent the first half of my life living in the United States and the second half living in Ukraine. I was the daughter of political refugees to the United States um, after surviving uh, a forced famine after surviving repression in the Soviet Union, they then had to survive a war and being um, slave labor in Germany. And they came to the United States with great new hope. And they taught us as many, many different diaspora groups in, in the United States and elsewhere have been taught that there's a responsibility to their homeland and to human rights, national rights in the homeland that their parents had to leave. Um, when I was a, a teenager and a member of the diaspora, we worked, all of us worked a great deal to bring attention to the situation of human and national rights in the USSR. Um, there were at that time, tens of thousands of political prisoners and religious prisoners in, in, in the Gulag, a religious repression of all confessions and, and all the communities worked together at that time. There were people from Poland and the Baltic countries and Ukraine and Moldova and, and every other country were working abroad to try to change the human rights situation. And indeed in 1986, I graduated with an MBA from University of Chicago, but instead of going to work in a bank, I decided I really wanted to commit myself to human rights for a few years because there was a wave of change coming. There was a feeling that things were changing in Eastern Europe and Central Europe and the Soviet Union. And it was an interesting time because um, you had people like, I remember attending a speech by Henry Kissinger who said, oh, when I asked him a, a question about the fall of the Soviet Union, he said, oh, we, 
we will sooner see California independent than we will see Ukraine independent. And so there were many naysayers, but there was a feeling of hope. And I went to work for at the State Department for someone whose family had all died in the Holocaust. And so he was very committed to human rights. And I remember when I first day on the job, the first thing he said to me is all those years after the World War II, I wrote many letters to the US government asking if they could help me find my parents. And I never got one letter back. And our goal in the State Department, in our office in the State Department today is that not one letter will ever go unanswered. And that was my responsibility to make sure that there was a feedback from the government to the people. So I worked on the, on the issue of human rights at the State Department where we were the first to start presenting to Gorbachev, to the Soviet Union, lists of political prisoners. Nobody had done that before. Some had presented lists of refused Nix people, Jewish people who wanted to leave. But this was the first time that we were actually presenting lists and case studies of people who were sitting in the gulag. They did not, the Soviet Union did not receive this with great um, warmth, but they very much wanted to have some kind of a dialogue. And so they would accept our lists. And, and the important thing then that I wanted to stress is that the people in the gulags then had hope. They had hope because they knew that President Ronald Reagan, the State Department, Europe, um, Canada were raising their issues on a name by name basis. They knew that it would be hard to kill them in their prison camps if their name was known in the world, if a senator, a president, a prime minister in some country mentioned their name, they had hope. And indeed, it was these heroes sitting in the camps and their hopes and what they expressed that brought the collapse of an empire. And it, this was part of a wave, what Samuel Huntington called a third wave of democracy. Um, because this, what was happening then in Central and Eastern Europe was following a path of democratization that had started very, very pretty much in the middle of the 1970s and 1974 in Southern Europe. Then it spread to military regimes in South uh, America in the late 70s, early 80s, reaching East, Southeast and South Asia by the late, 90, late 80s. And then, of course, our revolutions that came in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, where they toppled communist authoritarian rule. And then it started moving towards Central America. And then finally, the democratic trend came to Africa in 1990 with the release of Nelson Mandela and the legitimization of the ANC in South Africa. Um, and in, it turned out that in my region of the world, one revolution was not enough because so many of the positions of power, um, af even after independence, were, were taken by people who are, are former communists. And so we saw a new revolution in Georgia, the Re Rose Revolution. We saw the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004 which was a protest against fraudulent elections, corruption, and a demand to move more toward Europe. We saw a cedar revolution in Lebanon. But unfortunately, many experts have been talking about the fact that since the mid 2000s, uh, early 2000s, about 2004, five, we've seen the rate of growth of democracies falling and in fact, many countries are returning to authoritarian regimes. Um, we saw great hope with the green wave movement in Iran, with the Arab uprisings in 2010-12, with electoral challenges to autocracy in Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Um, but almost all of these attempts were, in, they encountered serious problems, heightened repression, and in some cases, even civil wars. In my country, we had to have yet another um, revolution in 2014. It was a popular protest uh, against the corrupt and autocratic and pro-Kremlin uh, President Viktor Yanukovych. They were able to remove him, but within days, um, both Crimea and then within weeks, Donbass, our eastern part of our country, was invaded and now 7% of our territory is occupied. And indeed, Samuel Huntington did talk about the fact that these waves of democracy would go forward and then there would be reverse waves as well. 
And unfortunately, I think that we're starting to see some of that. And that's what I want to address today, why that's happening and what we, but especially you as young people can do about it. Um, I don't know, Roshan, if you're able to show, I wasn't able to get it on my computer, the graphs that I sent to you um, to just put them up. Yes, Mecca, I shared the with Baku and they are now doing it. Okay. Mecca, please share the screen. If you can, fine. If not, I'll just describe it. Um, what I'm showing you now, just very briefly, are three graphs. Um, uh, this one is done by um, the Freedom House that shows a growing democracy gap. Please move on to the next one. I would like you to take a look at it, maybe look at it. This was also done by a Freedom House. When you see the number of free countries going down, partly free, pretty much staying the same, and not free, actually growing. And the third graph, please. Uh -huh. And this one was done by Larry Diamond of Stanford for the Journal of Democracy, where he shows, as you can see what I've been talking about, where you see from the, the 70s, a growth in um, electoral democracies, as well as in some liberal democracies. And then you see suddenly a change and a going down. Okay, I'm finished with the graphs. Um, so why, I'd like to give some reasons why I think there's been a democratic decline in the world. There are a number of reasons and it's very possible that you can name reasons that I might have missed. Uh, and it would be, I'd very much welcome your input on this. But first of all, I, I think that when uh, after 9-11 and the global war on terror started, um, attention was shifted from the United States, from Europe, um, from a democracy building, and it was shifted to a war on terror described by many people in different ways. And then a great disappointment when this intense desire to create a democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan didn't come to fruition as quickly. I remember speaking to leaders um, at the time say, and I asked them, why are you in Afghanistan? They said, the people asked us in and we will be democratic within, within months because the people are demanding this. And I think it was um, well-intentioned, but naive, the, those people saying that to me because obviously, it didn't, it didn't happen the way they had dreamed and hoped. And that caused a disappointment in democracy building around the world, in my opinion. We saw the economic crisis of 2008. We saw globalization and technical change that led to a rapid rise of new economies, new political players, decreasing influence of the United States and Europe in, in sort of leading events toward the, the, the way they wanted in terms of democracy, freedom. And it was accompanied the globalization with an uneven distribution of the gains and greater inequality in the world, which also um, led to possibly some countries becoming less democratic. Um, in advanced industrial democracy, we saw a growing divide um, as a result of globalization, as a result of change between the younger, more educated, cosmopolitan, more technologically sophisticated part of society in the cities and, the, and a divide with the older, less globalized population in rural areas and small towns. And I think we can see that in many different countries. And obviously the most obvious example has been the United States. Um, we've seen that more and more opponents of democracy in the world as their economies have grown, have also been willing to use first more hard power in militarily and as well as soft power. Um, we have seen, for example, something that for many people is a new phenomenon of a hybrid war. But for Ukraine, this is something we have been encountering for at least um, 17, 18 years. And that's where countries, like in our case, Russia, manipulate public sentiment, spread disinformation, amplify social divisions, um, cause greater polarization in our country and other countries. And obviously that has been possible because of social media, because of the fact that um, people get their information from so many more channels and are able to get into these silos of information. And um, we see more leaders because of social media, because of this change that a lot of, that frightens a lot of people, we have seen more leaders turning to populist rhetoric 
And this has led to more illiberal democracies. They're democracies. They were voted in, but they're voting in populists and people who are starting to adopt more authoritarian measures. And, um, you know, it's, I remember when my husband became president, people were demanding of him, for example, to fire all the judges and put in all his own people. And he said, by, by law, I'm not able to do that. And they said, yes, but you should become an authoritarian. You should do that because we need it. And obviously it would have been a good thing. But he said, if, if I do that and I keep moving the line of what's allowed, first of all, how do you know where it will end? And how will we know what people after me will do? And so you can't cross the line and break the rule of law in your own country. But unfortunately, there's a lot of desire. And we're seeing that even in the United States today, we're seeing it in Hungary, we're seeing it in other places where there's almost, you could say, in some ways, a grassroots demand for authoritarianism because of fear of change, fear of globalization, fear of others coming in. And I think what we need to do is first look at why democratization happened when it did and what we can do to try to put us, put us again on the right course. Um, it was a number of factors that led to democratization in, in the period that I was mentioning from 70 to the early 2000s. First, it came in places where there was homegrown democratic movements, some economic growth, populations that dreamed about freedom and democracy. And there were a significant number of activists and freedom fighters who were willing to fight and even die for this freedom. Second, and this is very important, at that time, the United States, Europe, Canada demonstrated a democratic resolve, power, example. And that's very important. Is not, I don't want to say it was not a military, it was a soft power. They showed things. And there was a determination from people like Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul, who supported solidarity. And when solidarity began to rise, that gave hope to the Lithuanians, that the Lithuanians gave hope to the Ukrainians and so on. And it, it, it started moving forward. So I think that there's an important role for dem um, democracies to play in promoting free elections, um, limited presidential terms, con constraints on executive power, judicial autonomy, free independent meeting, uh, media, free civil society organizations. You know, there was a time when even authoritarian non-democratic regimes felt that they needed to at least make gestures towards some kind of civil society and some kind of, of democracy because that was the, 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 the pressure that they were seeing from worldwide community. Um, in, the, in the former communist states of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, Western assistance was very much based on a move toward democracy. Um, EU membership depended on the adoption of liberal and democratic norms. And so it, was, it came from inside, but it also came from outside. Today, authoritarian governments around the world often push a false narrative that democracy is in decline because it's incapable of addressing people's needs. But I feel strongly that democracy is in decline because the most prominent countries that can symbolize it, that can exemplify it, that can sh show the world um, are doing, not doing enough to protect it in the world and within their own countries. We need global leadership, solidarity, international engagement for democratic states to support defenders of freedom in various countries and to use all means to counter their adversaries. They have to make sure that they continue to practice democratic norms at home. And um, I strongly fear that if free and dem democratic societies today do not support democracy and freedom at home and abroad, no country will be safe from dictatorship. I also want to say that it's not just the governments. Um, there's a role for NGOs and individuals in monitoring and bringing attention to human rights issues around the world. I have attended for many years something called the Oslo Freedom Forum, which was started by young people. And it brings together leaders, change makers, tech entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley people, wealthy donors, filmmakers, PR specialists, and they call in the bravest uh, representatives of human rights um, uh, you could say activism in the world who share their stories and then 
others offer their advice, how they can get their message out, especially in those countries where they have limited access to, um, to, to technology, how they can get their message out, how they can get financial support for their causes. I remember how many times, and I'm very ashamed to say how many times when I was there, I would hear about a human rights cause. For example, one woman who represented the Yazidis in Iraq, when she spoke, it took me hours to overcome how upset I was, not only at what she said, but the fact that I wasn't even aware that what had happened to her people. And so it's very important that we pressure our media to show much more, use our social media, pressure the media. You know, if you look at CNN or any of the other stations now, they, are, they have a bias. They show only what they feel is important. And we are missing the stories of human rights activism around the world. And I think that's extremely important. Now, just I would like to take, if you don't mind, a couple of more minutes just to talk about a few human rights situations in my own region. You all know that what's been happening in Belarus lately, um, since a fraudulent election, there have been massive, there's been massive police violence against protesters, many cases of disappearances and killings, and this has been going on for many years. Torture and ill treatment in detention, intimidation and harassment of civil society actors. Um, they, the Belarusian authorities have launched a full-scale at assault against civil society and systematically persecuting human rights defenders, journalists, media, and lawyers. Um, and the crackdown is such that thousands of Belarusians have been forced or compelled to leave, compelled to leave their homeland, seek safety abroad. And there are anything between 500 and 1,000 testimonies of torture victims. Uh, just in the past few days, Maria Kolesnikova, one of the great leaders, has been sentenced to um, 11 years in prison, her, her attorney to 10 years in prison um, for working for an opposition politician who was sentenced to 14 years in prison. She was supposed to be shipped out, but she, she escaped from the, from the transportation shipping her out, ripped her um, uh, passport so they couldn't throw her out, and, and now she's in prison. As a form of hybrid war, it's an interesting fact of what the Belarusians are doing now. They have been bringing Af uh, Iraqi as well as some Afghan refugees, people obviously desperately hoping to leave, bringing them to their border with Poland and bringing them in with lots of television cameras, because obviously the Poland, uh, Lithuania, Lithuanian and Poland border, and obviously the border guards are gonna stop them. There are dogs, they're filming all this. And then they're talking about the lack of democracy and human rights and freedom in countries like, like um, Lithuania and Poland when it's all a hybrid war set up. And so I think it's very important that we all always question what we see and understand and, and because so much of what we see now, it can be just a false flag type of operation. Um, in Crimea, the occupying Russian authorities have continued to target human rights defenders, including members of Crimean Solidarity, um, a grassroots self-help movement of ethnic Tartars. They have banned Majlis, the representative of the Crimean Tatar people. There are arbitrary intrusive house searches, interrogations by security forces, intimidation, um, persecution, arrests. Uh, just uh, last week, an outspoken Crimean um, a human uh, politi politician activist, four others were searched and detained. Um, courts continue to is issue deportation, forcible transfer orders. They have closed Ukrainian language, Crimean language schools and churches, cultural monuments of both the Crimean and Tatar people. And finally, just in Donbass, because I feel people don't know the stories of what's happening. In Donbass, we have seen since the um, invasion, suppression of all forms of dissent, arrests, interrogations, tortures, other ill treatment by de facto authorities, imprisonment, often in humane conditions. There was a cultural center, which was very supportive of modern art. It was a great museum called the Isolation Museum. The Isolation Museum is now a concentration camp. Um, more than 1 million people have been displaced. There are numerous reports of rapes by the occupying army. 
pillaging of factories and all the materials being taken into Russia, um, destruction of cultural institutions, environmental destruction, banning of Ukrainian and foreign television, closing Ukrainian schools, closing churches, mosques, um, systematic militarization and indoctrination of children at, at preschool and school under the guise of so-called uh, military patriotic education. They are taught to hate Ukraine. Um, I brought up all of this because I want you as young people to think about what you can do as individuals, what you can do as NGOs, what you can do to bring attention to human rights issues around the world. Each of you may have their passion about a, an area that you come from. Um, to bring awareness, how to participate in organizations such as let's say the Oslo Freedom Forum or create your own organization. What we can do about unfair media in the world, what we can do to use social media, um, what we can do to pressure our own governments to be more democratic, and then what we can do to pressure our governments to support freedom fighters around the world. So thank you very much. Now, I am looking, we have our next speaker and it is the, um, our guest from Moldova, and I can't see right now if you are there. May I ask you to take the floor now? Madame Yushchenko, thank you. Thank you for a nice uh, uh, speech, I would say, and for the nice uh, and good thing that we have all to take uh, in our mind and to remember this kind of um, important uh, thing. Today, I am going to discuss or talk to, to all of you about the uh, sustainable development uh, goals. Do we know what does this mean? Okay, I, I, I'm sure most of you uh, know. Um, I have one question to again to all of all of us. Do you want to make the world a better place to live? Yes, uh, so by having this in our mind, we can make the world a better place to live if we do everything according to uh, some values or according to those sustainable development goals that are set up in front of us. United Nations and the government of all the countries all, all over the world, they worked especially for obtaining this result. The result, the final result is to make the world a better place for all of us and for our future generation. In the number of those goals, I will not name all 17, but there are no poverty, no hunger, there is a, a goal like everybody in the good or access to good health and in good shape, uh, access to education, uh, gender uh, equality, responsible consumption, clean and clear, clean planet and clean environment, and of course, green energy. There are some of the goals that are very close to me and to my team uh, here in Moldova, and we are working every day to make this um, goals achieved by, by, by each of us in, in, in the team. What we have as um, stakeholders when we talk about this, we have the government from one side and we have society and business from the other side. All these three stakeholders are involved in achieving the sustainable development uh, goals. And I think to have the best results in sustainable development growth achievement is to have these three groups that I was mentioning, society, government and business, working together. Important for each of us, wherever we are doing, wherever we are working and whatever we are doing is to know that we can, we can contribute and we can put our support in terms of achieving a better world. The good news for all of us is that in order to make the world a better place, 
you don't have to be an expert or you don't have to be an, um, I don't know, a sharp activist. In order to achieve this, you have to do the things you are doing every day, maybe a little bit better because small steps can give us a better or a big result in the long run. The sustainable development growth are not something, uh, goals are not something that um, is very hard to achieve. Like I said, this is, um, or these are small things which is a, which is a part of our uh, daily life. I want to share with you some of the actions or steps that we are doing in our companies or that we can do all, all together in, in our daily life. Uh, first of all, we are responsible for our employees and we are trying to emphasize that uh, the practice of safe working place. We are trying to train or to, to, to teach to employees so they will be able to secure their uh, working place. Plus, I think it's very important to motivate the employees for a, um, some sport activities and also uh, some uh, internal um, healthy uh, state. It's important also to review and analyze who is your supply chain. For example, if you are producing some products and your products, for producing these products, you need some raw materials. It's important to know from whom you are buying these raw materials uh, to make sure that your partners from where you are buying, they care about the environment, they care about the human rights in their companies as, as well. We promote investing in renewables and uh, I am um, sure that, again, if we talk about the production, you can be in the situation of choosing from whom to buy the, the energy. So try to choose those which have the uh, production of the energy through renewables. So this is solar, this is wind, or this is biofuel. Uh, we promote encouraging uh, three R's, and for three R's we have reduce, we have reuse, and we have recycle. We know how um, how big pressure the plastic bottles and plastic bags and plastic containers are, are, are having about our earth. So again, we can encourage our customers or ourselves to, to, to serve our customers through motivating them to use the reusable uh, bags, for example. Again, in the offices, we can use for water supply, for example, coolers instead of uh, plastic bottles for our employees. Again, remember that every small change makes a huge impact when we are talking about uh, long run. In most of the companies, we are rewarding the, the employees that are making the biggest sales or those that are uh, bringing biggest amount of money to the company. So considering uh, this, I would say that it's nice to consider a bonus for those employees that are um, um, having the most environmentally conscious uh, approach to, towards the environment. So these kind of team members should be also um, awarded and uh, motivated. And one another um, um, advice from my side is to plant the trees. You can do it everywhere, you can do it with your friends, you can do it with your company or with your uh, colleagues in the university or, or, or something like that. That's for sure working uh, for the environment for, and for every, every single, uh, single of us. At the individual or personal level, uh, we can also do sustainable development goals uh, moving forward and achieving by what we do every day in our life. And there are some small steps that I am listening to, that I am stick to, and uh, these steps are listen, do, and analyze. It's very important to listen and to listen to, 
to, to yourself, first of all, to listen to your people, your uh, family members, and to listen to, to other people as well. Uh, then, when I'm saying doing the things, I, I'm, I'm saying that after we listen, we create our own plan according to what we feel and what we, we believe is correct. And uh, that plan should fit within our values or within our um, uh, way of seeing the things. And then, after doing it, we sit and analyze what we have done. Does it have a proper impact on the environment or, or, around, or about people around us? And uh, do we need to make some changes? Or do we need to adjust ourselves? It is very important, first of all, to, uh, to listen. And this is what I do every day. And believe me, it, it helps. It helps even in the uh, interpersonal relations uh, as well. Uh, I used to work in big corporations, in big companies. I also used to work for public uh, sector. And also I used to work for small companies, or let, let me call them startups. I learned to learn from what didn't work while analyzing your plan or your actions or your uh, do thing, you, you understand what is not working uh, okay and where you need to adjust yourself or uh, to adjust the situation maybe um, uh, accordingly. So you may ask me, what does this listening, doing and analyzing has with, uh, with sustainable uh, development goals? Um, I think and what I believe that you can use these steps in order to make uh, sustainable choices, sustainable decisions, and then sustainable choices. And these choices are in the relations to yourself, in the relations to people around you, and in the relations to other people you may not know, for example. And it is important to understand what is important to you, what is important to them, and how your choices can impact in a positive way the environment and the people around you. Of course, with care and with em em empathy. Um, the activity we have in our uh, daily life are in touch, of course, with all the sustainable uh, development goals. And uh, the impact can be much better if, like I was saying above, if we listen, if we do, and if we uh, very deeply analyze what we, we have done. When we ask ourselves what is important to me, or what is important to people around me, or um, how, um, uh, how this is going to, 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 to develop in the future, what can I do to, to um, uh, make this plan that I have in mind to happen, uh, this is making us uh, stronger because we know how the things are working, we know what we want and what are our uh, values at the end of the day, and uh, that works. I tried, I'm doing it every day and, and, and it works. And remember, we don't have to be super experts in order to make the world a better place. I. Uh, I thank you and uh, I'm happy to give the answers if there are any questions. Madam Yushchenko, please. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. I've actually taught social responsibility in the university here. And what I found is that many of the issues that you have raised are so extremely important, yet students do not always understand them in my own country. I'm very happy that we are with a group of youth here who understand very much SDGs and the importance. Um, but unfortunately, I, when I addressed my own students, I saw sometimes that they just, it wasn't a part of the education they had received in our school system. And it was not something that they considered very important when they started their business careers. Uh, do you feel differently in your own country in Moldova that young people are, are really um, starting to under, understand the idea of social responsibility of SDGs and of their role in, in, in promoting that? 
We have um, uh, we have many good examples in the company in the country, uh, like big companies or big corporations that uh, the social responsibilities uh, are one of the, or are something very important for the company. So the the way these companies are doing the things is to promote being a social responsible company is to uh, teach and to transfer this know-how to other small companies or maybe local companies as well. And together with this, we have our um, employees to get to know and to understand what is this and what is the impact, like I was saying, in the long run, uh, but also to transfer these knowledge to, to, to their kids, to their children or to their uh, friends as well. Uh, so I believe in uh, learning by example or from example, and I think that's uh, something that uh, will um, have a bigger impact in, in, in the future as well. Thank you very, very much. Um, I would like to turn the floor to uh, two of our NGIC alumni, youth, ask them to make some remarks and also to pose any questions. Unfortunately, Prime Minister, um, uh, Foreign Minister Livni had to leave us, but again, we could still discuss the things that she talked about. I'd like to start, please, with Amina Zamulina from Russia. Uh, Ms. Katerina, she is, uh, she, I, I sent you a message that she had the traffic and uh, that's why she oh, couldn't sorry. be able to use the internet. Uh, but you Instead didn't of send that, it on chat. You probably sent it on WhatsApp. I haven't been yes, looking. Please, okay, please, I apologize. I and apologize. Instead, we have Karim Karimov from Azerbaijan uh, to, to speak on her behalf. Uh, oh, I mean, okay. instead of her. Okay, yeah, I did see that Karim would be speaking as well. Okay. I thought I'd put him a little later, but that's fine. Karim Karimov, please. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Katerina. In these recent days, we have learned a lot from you, and thank you very much for it. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karim. Uh, I'm the director of uh, Azerbaijan House in Barcelona, and also I'm a football agent. <clears throat> I graduated from the law faculty at the University of Barcelona, and uh, I will say that uh, human rights topic have been always a uh, very sensitive topic for me and that's why I would like to share like just few opinions of mine with you. Uh, human rights uh, is a set of principles uh, concerned with equality and fairness. Uh, they are not like a recent invention. Ideas about the responsibilities and the rights have been always a uh, main topic for all societies through, uh, throughout the history. Uh, since the uh, end of the Second World War, uh, there has been a united effort by all nations around the world to decide uh, which rights are belong to all people and how they can be best be promoted and protected. Every person has a dignity and value. Uh, let's say uh, um, <clears throat> every person has a, a every person uh, has a uh, right to choose uh, freedom on their lives. And these lives uh, is uh, free of uh, fear, harassment, or discrimination. Uh, let's say uh, human rights can be defined as a basic uh, rights of, uh, basic rights of uh, human rights, which uh, people around the world are decided, uh, agreed are essential. These rights, uh, let's say, uh, right to their life, right to the fair trial and freedom from torture and harassment or like uh, inhuman treatment and the right to education, right to public health and freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion. All these uh, rights, all these human rights are the same for all people in the world, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, regardless of our background, where we live, what we think or what we do. That's what uh, makes uh, human rights universal. And of course, in this process, governments have a particular uh, responsibility uh, to make sure that people are able to enjoy their, uh, their rights. And they must establish and maintain laws and services 
that people are able to enjoy life in which uh, their rights are respected and uh, protected. The, let's say the world is going to a new decade, but unfortunately, it hasn't been the best uh, few years for human rights. If you look into the 2021, uh, we can see is there are like a, some human uh, rights issues, uh, which is like a, of now and also for future. Human trafficking, uh, let's say refugee crisis, and worker rights, gender equality, and nationalism, attacks on journalists, and uh, spread of misinformation, and let's say uh, human rights and technology, uh, and also more, uh, more effective United Nations and commitment to human rights. As we enter a new decade, I do believe that uh, the international community has an opportunity to show their real commitment to human rights. And also governments need to raise awareness of human rights and social justice issues. And we, uh, as a young people, as a young leaders from around the world, uh, we have to also take our main part in this process. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you. And now if I, is Ivan Ivanov here from North Macedonia? Great, hello um, Ivan. Hello, from Macedonia, not North Macedonia. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm Yuri Ivanov from Macedonia. I'm a, an assistant professor at the International Balkan University. I teach political science. So because our time here is limited, I'll try just to throw some provocations or some questions instead of elaborating things or giving some definitions that I have in mind. So. I really believe that we are walking through this path that I feel and I explain like a tired and exhausted and, or even for some scholars, wicked march of democracy. And according to the last um, uh, edition of the Economist Journal, they said like, forget about democracy, let's talk about freedom and justice, okay? But what is freedom and what is justice? For me as a professor, those were two terms and two notions that were the hardest, hardest to define, right? and democracy as well. But for democracy, for me, will always be 50 plus one, 50% plus one, and that's democracy, that's the power of majority, and that's it. But for freedom and justice, we have many definitions, right? Depending on different systems, we can talk about different conceptualization of freedom and, and different conceptualization of what justice really is. And that's why the world politics right now needs this strong feeling of, of empathy for the common good, okay? Because I don't believe the democracy is really enough. The, the neoliberal democracy is not enough to be careful just to be terminologically precise. Because there might be nothing wrong with those pillars, but the concept of the neoliberal democracy, I believe that it's being torn apart and it's sort of lost today, okay? And something that I like to call this sovereignty, okay? Because we're mentioning human rights all the time. In the name of human rights, there is an international community that is decided that through some sort of intervention can erode the sovereignty or autonomy or the pillars of the Westphalian world order today. And here I don't mean only authoritarian countries, okay? And we're having a perception, I believe it's a perception, that we're going through some crisis of freedom right now, or the more, to be more precise, crisis of the liberal order than neoliberalism. But the perception really is that if the neoliberalism is experiencing a problem or a struggle, that is the crisis of the whole humanity in general. We're having many crises, right? We're having crises in Asia, we have crises in Africa, we have many crises in countries that are not sharing those values, right? And this predominance of West over the world, over the world order, led to a perception that the problem of the neoliberal capitalism concretely is the problem of humanity in general. And with the last great recession, so-called, that was barely felt or had impact in South, South, uh, Southeast uh, Asia, right? So the countries in those areas that are a reflection of something that is not like the states of the West or the neoliberal values, were more resistant to the crisis that we experience in the Western, uh, in the Western world. And that's why maybe we're having this illusion of the illusion of the problem of the freedom right now, and we're having problem with defining those, right? So like young generation, like let's say Z generation and myself as a generation of the millennials, we are not really concerned about freedom. Why, why I'm saying this? Or let's say we're willingly sacrificing our freedom, right? Because the old world was based on the consensus between freedom and security, right? We were giving significant part of our freedom instead for someone to guarantee our security, right? 
Although Benjamin Franklin said that who is ready to sacrifice freedom for security, eventually we will lose both of them. Okay, and why we are sacrificing? Because I had a wonderful conversation with Professor Ismail Saragelin, who which I admire a lot. He's one of the greatest uh, erudits and greatest minds that I ever met. He said that in today's world, we should understand that there is a new consensus, right? Instead of the old consensus between freedom and security, now for the new generation, there is a new consensus between privacy and services, right? We're willingly sacrificing our privacy. With that, we're sacrificing as well our freedom for someone to provide us services, right? Like young generation, we're just clicking on our phones. We're agreeing on everything so willingly. And because of consumerism as well, we are somehow getting again in this voluntary slavery, right? So the thing is that today we're having the perception, you know, of freedom, but somehow for unlimited freedom. Because if you ask me, the worst enemy of freedom is the unlimited freedom, the freedom itself, right? We should know where are the limits, where are the boundary, what is the common sense, you know? Why do we have all these erosions of moral values around the world? And especially within the political leadership of our countries, right? Because I really believe, because I read whole books, because I, this is what I want, and I believe if you'd like to drink the water, you should drink it from the source. And the ancient philosophers like Aristotle said that what was moral and ethics for the society, for the community, that should be politics for the community. And that's why I believe those moral and ethic values should be the so-called universal values. But however, to go just back on the, the topic of freedom or, or the democracy, uh, et cetera. So, how I witnessed that what Ismail Sergeyevich was saying is really true because I visited many smart city institutes around the world, Shanghai, Barcelona, and Germany. So they're amazing. I mean, the technology is awesome. So they're making life of people easier, right? They have unusual, they have detectors that can detect uh, unusual body behavior. They're measuring your temperature around the city, uh, phase recognition, et cetera. So yeah, life of people is getting easier. But with that, we are sacrificing our privacy, we're sacrificing our freedom, and then we're getting all the services and our life is getting more and more easier. And about the future, about the whole crisis that we're experiencing now in liberal system is a new uh, liberalism. I always give this example of Singapore because I believe that Singapore provided many interesting solutions about the problems or let's say the challenges that we're having. You know, because from the Western perspective, you know, they're having this Machiavellian logic, right? The end justify the means. That's true, although Machiavelli never said that in that uh, context, but yeah, the end justified the means only if the state is under a threat, only the state is under attack, not for personal interest, not for selfishness, not for power, okay? And so what I witnessed, all, not what I witnessed, but what I read and what I heard from the leader of Singapore, he made it pretty clear. And by the book, on paper, it sounds perfect. He said that they're building their country on three pillars, especially the policymakers in that country, pragmatism, meritocracy and honesty. And I believe this is the future, not only for political leaders, but if you're part of any company in, in every surrounding, and especially if you're part in, you have part in decision-making process in your countries, these are the three pillars. Pragmatism means that if you have a problem, find a solution. Even if you do not find a solution, just walk to the right path towards your solution. Meritocracy is something that we are lacking, lacking everywhere. You know, it's more important what do you know rather than who do you know, right? If you're good at something, if you're professional for what you're doing, you're the right person for that. And honesty, right? Zero corruption. This is probably the toughest part, right? Because we're witnessing corruption everywhere. Because we are having also the perception that how do we practice democracy? Through elections, right? And for many people, the perception is that if you go out and vote, you fulfilled your democratic duties, or I might say democratic obligations as well. And that's why Colin Crouch in 2001 um, offer this term of post-democracy, right? Because it's not, yeah, you go out, we elect, we use the elections as a tool, we practice democracy. This is the moment of the social contract between the individual and the state, and that's it. People forget about anything else until the next election. What is important, how do we practice, should practice democracy? It's through this period between the two terms of different politicians, of different parties, or whatever it is, right? So according to many relevant sources, many relevant scores, parameters, Somehow the perception is that if you're practicing universal values and you are on this side that you are, uh, let's say, put it as a free and democratic country. But universal values nowadays, if you ask me, are becoming more and more insistent. Because even Henry Kitchener said that we cannot 
see the world only from the monochrome uh, monochrome perspective of the Western logic, right? Although he was a hardcore realist. And why I'm talking this especially to young leaders, I mean, especially during the educational process that is re later reflected in the social life, I really do believe that it's going through a process of being in the state because there is no conflict of ideas. There is no criticism of the liberal idea and the values of the neoliberalism, okay? And this, if you have, then it's a threat to democracy, it's a threat to freedom, threat to human rights. And the system that wishes to be inclusive suffers precisely from an overdose of inclusive tendencies that have no tolerance for what is outside of it. And this should not mean denial, just to be clear, this should not mean denial of the rights of the cultural minority to, ex uh, to exercise their civil rights and freedom, exactly the opposite. But what worries me really is the pretentiousness that leads to the tendency that only the liberal, the new liberal ideas are universal values and valid in this global order. And everything that is opposite is retrograde. It's a threat to democracy and it's a threat to freedom and etc. And even if you visit, I believe there are many great people here from many different universities around the world, even in the biggest names of the universities, the, the so-called, right, because the universities are temple of wisdom, right? you can feel that and you can feel the outdated me dated mechanism so it was really interesting nowadays the the testimony and the letter that cornell west wrote to his how he called beloved harvard right because he left harvard because of that as he said decadence of the market driven universities right and he said here i feel the spiritual world rot and spiritual mold and that was the reason why he left really harvard no clash of ideas no something outside of this neoliberal logic because at the end of the day it's a threat and however i wouldn't end up with this because i have no we have a limited time and i will go again to mr ismail sarah gildin he put it out perfectly in his book because he said that as a global order and also democracy itself we are going through five he said contradictions and the first contradiction is something that i just mentioned that the current world order was built on a set of concepts and ideas that are dominant today, that, that, that are dominant today, that are entirely Western creation. And if you read Huntington, if you read a Clash of Civilization, you will see that even Huntington was saying that, that especially about universal values, because he said the world today is in the hand of something that he called Davos, Davos culture, right? What 1% is deciding, it should be practiced on the whole humanity. Like, most of the rest of the world accept those values, but did not participate in the creation and implementation as Professor Sarah Gildin said. And according to him, the second contradiction relates to Muslim fanatism, okay? That is forcing, and there are, let's say, um, there are forces that are upset the stability and the order of the countries all over the world. And they are to that threat to Europe, to America, to the whole world. And they actually, they actually are trying to overturn something or the world order that was um, uh, stated, like, as he said, as Sarah Gildan said, the lines that were drawn in the sand after the Sikas Picot agreement, right? And to establish a religious state or barbaric and fanatical, fanatical ideologies. So the challenge here is from the ideological nature. The reminiscence, the rise of totalitarian ideologies such as, such as was the communism in the 19th and 20th century. And the third contradiction, according to him, is this very nature of the state, right? Because the foreign policy is based on so that is that is based on soft power cannot be effective and deliver results in times of crisis. And the lack of commitment, as he said, of European members to an unfitted strategy right now. And for me as a Macedonian, we felt that on our own skin. Okay. The fourth contradiction is one between the politics and economy. This is really interesting because globalization yeah, is a process that united the world in economic aspect, not in political one, okay? The fifth country and the last contradiction is the, the obstacles that UN design is having and the absence of another alternative design of a forum, let's say, where major powers are discussing big issues to bring solutions, not only to have declarative decision and, uh, and consensus, okay? And similar to Professor Ismail Sarah Gildin, now Ferguson is saying that we are having four key components, or, or he calls them uh, black boxes of our civilization. Democracy, capitalism, rule of law, 
and civil society. And they are the same ones that according to now Ferguson, this civilization is being, because of them and the, 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 the erosion of them, the world is being degenerated, okay? So that's why I believe I believe in the, the idea of democracy. I believe in the future of democracy, but I believe in something that I like to call, you know, jazz freedom. And I will end up with this. This is a great anecdote. It was my professor of mine who came from United States. He visited Macedonia and he did some survey uh, in Kosovo. At that time, Kosovo was not an independent country. It was still part of, of Serbia, right? And he visited Kosovo and he came back and he said, um, you know, guys, what? I don't believe that the things will go in the right direction in Kosovo. I said, right. Well, nobody's listening to jazz music. And I asked him, like, because I was 18 or 17 at that time, I said, Professor, what is the connection? What is the relation between jazz and Well, you know, said, jazz is music of individuals. Individualism is the prerequisite for liberalism. Without liberalism, you don't have democracy. And it stick to my head for a long period, right? After three or five years or four years, he came back again to finish his survey because it was a long survey. And he went back to Kosovo again. And he came back to Macedonia after his survey was done. And he said, you know what? Only in Pristina, Pristina is the capital of Kosovo. Now they have three jazz clubs. And two, three months after that, Kosovo was an independent country. And I believe in that individualism, but I believe in individualism that unfortunately is become more and more egoistic now in the West. Yeah, individualism is one of the basis of this world toward of us as individuals, as human beings, but not as egoism and not as now it's being practiced. And that's why I believe that we should read some different books, like even uh, Ferguson said, to read maybe again. Well, and I'm going to have to say that we're going to run out of time for everyone else. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, this is it. I mean, I mean, you know, just I believe that if something seems impossible, we should really demand that, right? because that was the, 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 the logo of the protest in, in France, to be realistic and to demand the impossible. And while the whole world is looking now for a new paradigm, unfortunately here at the Balkan, we're still fighting for our right for determination, right? And I'm asking, is that freedom? Is that a universal human right? Someone to ban your right of self-determination and to add additional, additional requests for your... That's the problem of decision-making with consensus because Yugoslavia was having a process of decision-making with consensus, but where is that today? Where is Yugoslavia? So I believe that we need changing mechanisms. We need to change the outdated mechanism to beat again the world to democratic values, but what are the core values of democracy and to have universal values, but only through moral and ethics. Thank you so much. The, the good news that there was an international consensus on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights where and the basic freedoms and i think that that's very important that we continue to follow them i would like to now ask mr rosmel rodriguez of portugal to to speak thank you so much um good afternoon everyone my name is rosmel rodriguez i am i'm venezuelan but i currently live in portugal before starting i want to thank you for asking me to be part of this incredible initiative it's an honor to share this opportunity with all of you, where it's clear that uh, that those of us who are participating in this uh, event, we are actually concerned to build a better world together. Therefore, I take uh, I take this opportunity to present my thoughts to you. Um, well, um, friends, colleagues, and all distinguished excellencies, um, I think that the future is here, and we have to work together for it. We will never have a better opportunity than now to be connected and aware of the global problems that threaten us. The threat which go beyond any difference we feel and we may have the leadership of the 21st century should not be understood outside the logic of sustainability because it is only this is on the only path that that can guarantee the best uh, possible future. We are counting down the implementations of the SDGs under the imminent threat of ecological crisis and climate emergency. Um, but this task continues to be far, far from easy, despite the fact that every day we are more and more, more people uh, around the world who's taking 
on this individual and collective responsibility to comply the 2030 agenda. The leadership focus on the sustainable development is necessary. This is a huge true, but I will say that we must also mm -hmm. highlight the leadership of young people for sustainable development. It's time to move beyond the, the classic discourse of involving young people. It's time for me, the time of the practice of the sustainable leadership of young people to give a strategic space to those who are and are going to face the future that looks uh, far from optimal. Young people today, through the new technologies, are more organized and, partic and participate better under the under new unconventional schemes, what some academics call the technopolitics. And um, this situation has developed a new perspective of, of global governance problems from a new perspective of, of the local. That is to say that we are looking for local solutions to global problems, the local, isn't it? While we are interconnected by these struggles, we need more support, more visibility, more recognition, because most of these efforts are, at, are atomicized and out of synchronization. In addition to having no visibility and institutional support, for governments or international institutions. Um, over, over the years, young people have become the main actors of the present and will gonna be the main actors of the future to guarantee a structural reform in the world system. Um, there are many young people who are working toward implementing the SDGs in our areas and in our specific realities. And we, the young leaders who are like, who are here, and we are an expression of those millions of voices, millions of young people who want the best possible world. And it's our opportunity to develop that collective global path, which is the 2030 agenda. Uh, because the SDGs are a roadmap, no? a roadmap for us, the, for all the young leaders, which will not end in 2030. This will be the constant in our development as society. And I take uh, a thought from my good friend, Kaiser Nawad from Pakistan, as he said yesterday, something like, today, these are the major 21st century reform in the agendas. Will, which largely influence the local reform agenda for all nations around the world. And I have no doubt that the 2030 generation together will, uh, with the great leaders, um, we will do everything possible to build a sustainable future and lead the planet on this new path and this new challenge. I would like to leave you a reflection of my, um, doubt and taking into your account knowledge and excellence trajectories, my dear colleagues, how will the United Nations and the government help young leaders to gain recognitions and visibility for the institution? And how will the United Nations continue to support us in training in order to continue executing our collective and individual work for a substantial reform of the world system through to the implementation of the SDG. I gonna finish with, um, I would like to let you know that all of you uh, are an example to the world and a reference when we talk about the uh, commitment to to have a better world. Well, this is my intervention. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, obrigado, and um, God bless you always. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Um, I'm going to shake up the little the list a bit and ask Kaiser Nawab from Pakistan to speak now. I know a little bit of his work, and he has really courageously fought some issues in his own country and very successfully. Kaiser, are you there? Uh, yes, thank you, madam, for your kind words. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and Nizami Gingling International Center organizers, thank you again for inviting me to speak on today's uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the role of youth. 
Uh, firstly, I would like to say a few words of appreciation to my fellow young colleagues as they are such an exciting group of people. And I know the speakers, organizers, and I myself have been really inspired listening to their speeches and stories. And I cannot wait to collaborate post-forum with them in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs are a global agenda for transforming our world. In order to achieve this, it is vital that youth are included in the process. In previous decades, youth involvement may have been thought of as light touch are seen as organizations paying lip service to the idea without truly committing to it. Now, however, there are significant moves towards valuing the youth voice and working towards inclusive conversations with the understanding that governments and organizations that collaborate with young people will be more successful in meeting targets set out as a part of the 17 SDGs. COVID-19 has been a striking setback to our collective goals. On education alone, 20 million more girls will never be able to go back to their classroom. After this crisis and global, global education funding gap, is already increased to $200 billion per year. The pandemic is a setback, but it cannot be an excuse. Our goal should not be returned to the weddings world. We need a profound commitment with the way the world should be a better place to live. I truly believe that the overall success of the SDGs depends on youth engagement because young people are critical thinkers, change makers, innovators, communicators, leaders, dear participants, sustainable development is a very brilliant idea for the preservation of the planet and making it an inclusive living place for all. Prosperity, peace, and partnership are the fancy slogans which inspired me as a global citizen. In 2015, when SDGs came, I traveled to different parts of the world and saw the beauty and, land and landscape of nature. Being a youth activist, it seems awkward when I see waste and garbage all around us in big cities and now even in small villages and town. Our water, air, and land are being polluted due to corporatization and industrialization. Carbon emission is a back threat to over natural environment and habitat. Traveling from Europe to America, from Australia to Asia and Africa, you can also, you can see how our earth is facing climate related challenges. This world is becoming more dangerous to all living creatures. And we are the killer of our mother nature only for our market and corporate interests. Remember, if there is no life on earth, then what will be the value of your capital and money? So I appeal to all to join hands and protect nature and work for inclusive development, sustainable development. But in my appeal, the big challenge is to establish harmony between corporatization and sustainable development. But how can we do this? This is my question to all humanity. Thank you all. Before ending, I may have one question uh, to Kitrin. I know maybe I, never, I don't get a time later. So may I ask Kitrin if you allow me? Please. So my question is, uh, human rights are the fundamental pillars of liberal democracy. Who determines that this is my right and this is not my right? Why in some democracies, some rights became crime and some other places they became rights? For example, freedom of expression is the most critical human right that can be misspelled and misconceived everywhere. Why? And this is totally linked to my work as I shared with you for the gender minorities. Thank yes, you. I know, yes, I know you have done a great deal and I can imagine how difficult it was for you in, in your country. And I'm so glad that you said that you had success, which it, it pleases me. You know, we have to return to basic values and to the Declaration of Human Rights. We have to create institutionalized systems where everyone has a voice 
And then there is democracy, but there is always, when you talk about democracy, it's, it's, it does include the, the rights of minorities. And so it's the creation of systems and it's the ability to, to become involved. As somebody said, it's not just um, voting and leaving. It's, there is a very important role for activism. And it, but it's a process, it's not an, there's no answer. It's the, the thing about um, freedom and democracy is that it is a process. The problem with authoritarian is that the process is pretty much done and the decisions are made for you. And we wanna create a world where we help make the decisions. That's how I feel. So I would like to turn to Kekishan from Canada. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, colleagues. Uh, hello again, my name is Keh Kusha, and I'm the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. And I was asked to elaborate a bit more about the sustainable development goals and its continued relevance uh, today. So as we all know, the fundamental objective of the SDGs is to create a world where no one is left behind and to achieve this lofty goal, reducing inequalities has to be the most important driver. Now, in a report that was published last year at the height of the pandemic by the chief economists of the United Nations, this inequality index map shows the startling increases in inequalities in even the most developed of countries, clearly indicating polarization of wealth and opportunities between a privileged minority and the vast majority of mainly people of color and indigenous communities. We also have the Voluntary National Reviews or VNRs uh, undertaken by countries that aim to facilitate the sharing of experiences, including successes, challenges, and lessons learned. And they are absolutely critical to accelerating the implementation of the 2030 agenda. Now, the worrying aspect is that only 43 countries have conducted VNRs in 2021 a year when it was most needed. And while we all know that there are 17 SDGs, there needs to be greater awareness about its 169 targets and 232 indicators. Out of these 169 targets, 21 had an end date of 2020, with 12 of them focused on biodiversity, and they are absolutely essential for the success of both the SDGs and the Paris Agreement on climate change. And these 12 biodiversity targets had a 2020 endpoint because they were originally agreed under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity as part of the set of Aichi biodiversity targets. So it's critical that the process of rebuilding better must focus on resetting the ambitions for these targets to achieve our vision of a sustainable and secure world by 2030. And what is even more important to remember is that these SDGs are known as the people's goals because it depends much on civil society to localize them and actually achieve them at the ground level and ensure that the unique solutions to global challenges are implemented on the ground. I'll quickly give one such example, which is that of mangrove conservation and regeneration for SDG 15, life on land, for instance, we at Green Hope Foundation have planted over 6,000 mangroves worldwide from the Sundarbans to Kiribati to Suriname to Bali to ensure that these communities have their natural protection from climate change and these sea storms to protect their biodiversity and people. However, in Hawaii, these same mangroves are invasive species and cause untold destruction to its local biodiversity. So that is why implementing SDG 15 in Hawaii is vastly different from other parts of the world. And this highlights the importance of different solutions and localizing the SDGs. So as all of our uh, panelists have stated today, the SDGs provide us with this framework of action for governments, for private sector, for civil society. And now it's up to us to identify our most pressing challenges in our own zones of influence and not just blame others and just talk about the SDGs, but actually start acting with urgency to localize and implement the sustainable development goals at the ground level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our final talk 
today that's scheduled and then we could always ask questions and, and discuss a little bit more. We still have a few minutes left. Is um, Faisal Shahid from Sri Lanka. Thank you for the flow. Uh, Mrs. Zippy Lethney, if she's there. Uh, Mr. Carol Gabricci and uh, Katrina Yushchenko, members of the Alumni Nizami, Alumni of Nizami Ganjadi International Center and leaders past, present and future. I am Faisal Shahid from Sri Lanka. I'm a research officer attached to the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs. I contribute to uh, designing the policy framework, and uh, I also write as a columnist in several newspapers. I prepared a speech today, but I decided to shove it down today and uh, decided to comment on a few things that came up today instead of uh, discussing the parts of the speech. So there were the primary part which I chose to address was a point, a question rather, uh, that came out from Ms. Uh, Mrs. Katrina Yushchenko, where there is an increase in authoritarianism in face of democracy. And I thought I'll contribute to that conversation by providing more reasons for it. One of them is probably the involvement of China, which pushes for communism. We've seen that uh, influence all over the world. Lately, they've been pushing to invest in countries that are likely to go bankrupt with intent to salvage from the debt trap they have created. These soft economic policies of China have tended for leaders to thrive on the corruption and push for policies that support corrupt policies as well. For example, in Sri Lanka, just recently, just days before, there was the finance amendment mill in Sri Lanka, which actually enables money laundering. This is because they're caught up in a debt trap. And I've seen that this is not just the case in Sri Lanka, it's uh, in other countries as well, like uh, in Africa, where they build the African Union as a good gesture, but then again, it's also, uh, it shows a sign of goodwill because like, eventually they plan to invest and occupy more territories and uh, influence the politics in those regions as well. It's the same in Colombia as well, and most recently Afghanistan. There is increasing influence from China, which has pushed for different policies, especially which supports their communist venture. Then uh, another possible uh, uh, reason is the rising call for socialism, especially in times of pandemic. This is supported in uh, USA as well, which is uh, an option that has been called upon in face of capitalism. This is actually in opposition to capitalism. Another reason is that people with too much freedoms often seek subjugation for some reason. This is something that I've noticed from my own personal uh, from experiences among the people. But psychological reasons probably a Stockholm syndrome that makes people yearn for what was, even if what is available in the present may be much better compared to what was. I believe people yearn to be satisfied by limited options instead of having unlimited choices where they uh, can't decide for themselves. So that's why they prefer subjugation at certain times. And another reason, there is a globally prevailing cancel culture from among the people where the right to dissent is not respected. It's a right to dissent, which uh, has like, been shunned by a lot of people just because they have different views. In many parts of the globe, we find the left-wing forces trying to cancel out the right-wing forces. And uh, the right-wing forces have been trying to cancel out the left-wing notion. The reactions have become increasingly aggressive over the years, and in places where, especially in places where there are affirmative action policies, such as the mask mandates, then uh, the abortion-related matters, feminism, gender fluidity, and several other topics, the left-wing and right-wing have clashed recently. This resistance is only going to get more aggressive unless there is tolerance for the view. After all, it is the right of freedom of expression. As long as it does not impinge on the rights of others, it is such a culture of tolerance for the right to dissent that can bridge the gap between the two extreme men and thereby bring about stable leadership in a democratic structure. Also, I wanted to comment on uh, some of the points that, uh, that were made by Mr. Karim Karimov, where he spoke of the universality of human rights. Now, human rights has four principles. They are universality, it is inalienable, inalienable it is independent and indivisible. However, I've been working on a research paper on the concept of margin Appreciation as a That is that rights clash. For example, the freedom of movement, which is restricted uh, by the freedom of peaceful assembly. Which rights should prevail in case they clash? If there is a 
an assembly somewhere, there is, there is a protest taking place and people cannot pass through, which right should prevail? It's a clash of rights. It's not one right superseding the other. So you get issues of that nature. And the second core issue is cultural elitism, which seeks to apply human rights differently, taking into account the general practices of the people in the region. For example, the Eastern emphasis on the family unit if, is far stronger than the Western views on family, which means you don't get kicked out of your home at the age of 18 years. For ex and uh, in another example, I got sponsored for my higher education by my parents, even at the age of 25. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say is like the notions are significantly different between the Eastern and the Western world. And uh, this requires a lot of thinking as to how it culturally applies, uh, especially as, as we view human rights in line with the principle of equality. The reason I say this is because the way people interpret human rights is different from one another. It has a threshold which is subject to certain restrictions and standards. And there are many issues that, right, that require thought. Human rights evolves with time, and we need to understand that the issues that come with time and resolve them before the issues get ahead of us, like it has now. And I also wanted to address another point by Mr. Ivan, uh, Ivano. There was a point on uh, Muslim fanaticism that I partially agreed to. In fact, Sri Lanka has suffered at the hands of the ISIS. In 2019, there was the Easter Sunday bomb by Muslim extremists. And uh, the people who suffered from it were Christians who were, who were actually rejoicing in the church uh, on Easter. But uh, I don't see this as a religious problem, but rather a systematic mode of radicalization by pushing some people to social extremes. The reasons for politicization is partly or even primarily political. There is no religious extremism without funding, supply of arms, or some ex ex escape room. Radicalization needs a solution, but a large part of it is because of political gain. And it's because of political contribution that these things happen. And they use, they employ tools of psychological programming to make sure that this happens. So on the topic of democracy, as I return to it once again, there was the, a leading scholar, American scholar, which was also mentioned, mentioned by uh, Katrina, uh, Professor Larry Diamond of the Stanford University, had explained democracy as a system of government that fulfills three essential criteria. One, an electoral process by which persons are elected to represent the masses at different levels, a process of inclusive participation and accountability, and adherence and respect for the individual liberties and freedoms and other rights of the people. These are procedural factors of democracy. In a sense, the people must hold their elected representatives accountable. They have a right to demand their fundamental freedom to be upheld and demand that the procedural factors of democracy as specified by Professor Larry Diamond be recognized as the ultimate scale on which a true democracy is based. However, except for the right to life, no right is absolute. Every purported breach must be viewed in view of, must be weighed in view of margin of the margin of appreciation. Every person must realize that their view deserves respect, but no person ought to impose their views on others. No person must be discriminated for his or her belief, and every person living in a democracy must recognize the right to dissent. Live and let live. Only then can a true democracy that ensures people's freedoms can subsist for the betterment of the people. Thank you, and over to you, Katrina. Thank you very, very much, Pfizer. Um, we have reached the end of our scheduled speakers, commentators, and so on. And I'd just like to ask if anyone would like to raise their hand and pose questions or make another comment. Well, if that's not the case, I think that means that um, all of the speakers today made their points well. <laughs> and, and I see we finished about 15 minutes earlier today and I'm pleased about that. And I look forward to our last day tomorrow. And, um, and so we'll see you tomorrow at about five o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>